thanks everyone for coming after lunch. Um, so today I'm going to talk about detecting credential compromise in AWS, but also going to then pivot after we talk about how to detect that compromise and talk about how we can actually prevent it from the get-go. So if you were in the talk yesterday that I was joined with Travis McPeak, I introduced some of these concepts about how you could do some sort of API protection, uh, protect your metadata service. And so today we're actually going to deep dive into those topics and get a little more detail in how, what, what sources we're using for detecting the, the compromise and how we took that and then decided, well, that's not good enough. Let's pivot and try to prevent that. Uh, but for those that don't know, I'm Will Binkson. I am a senior security engineer on the cloud infrastructure security team at Netflix. Our team's mission is to protect the infrastructure security of Netflix throughout all of our uh, accounts, our environments within AWS mainly. And uh, my team's main goal is protecting that the ultimate low-level piece of AWS, and that's the credential. Where everything starts is the permission, and that's where we're going to be focusing today. I want to first just start and say this is not a complex machine learning talk. I don't have these like really advanced models. I'm not a data scientist. I'm just a security person that happens to find data very interesting. Uh, we just set the mood for everyone, so I hope everyone likes it dark in here because we're going to go deep. Um, but we're, we're, it's, I've been corrected, and they've, someone has actually told me this is machine learning because you, it's unsupervised. It kind of learns as you go. But you can take it, call it what you want. Um, but today we're going to talk about how you detect compromise in AWS. Uh, so the scope of the detection piece of this talk is detecting compromised AWS instance credentials. And so if you're not familiar, instance credentials in AWS are short short-lived keys. They're anywhere from one to six hours lived. They are issued by the service for you and rotated automatically. Uh, the security token service, STS, in AWS is what's actually providing these temporary credentials. And they're being provided based on the actual IAM role that you provide to your instance when you actually deploy. So you can use this within the EC2 world or as well, if you're just creating temporary credentials for your users within your environment, you can also use this STS service. It's there for, for you. Uh, I, I believe it's 15 minutes up to 36 hours, depending on uh, how you actually federate into the STS service on how you can issue those. But mainly within EC2, it's one to six hours that you're going to see these credentials lived. Uh, and hopefully, AWS keeps up and rotates those for you automatically. So we're going to be focusing mainly on these types of credentials uh, around the EC2 world. But you can apply this methodology across containers or any other means that you can control how credentials are actually issued in your environment. So what's the problem? We have all these credentials moving throughout our environment. By default in AWS, when a credential is issued, it's issued and available to the world. Amazon makes it very easy for you to operate in the cloud in that everything works from everywhere. So when you craft a credential, it's valid from my machine, from your server, from other servers, wherever you want. So that's a problem that we're trying to address today, is how do we detect when a credential issued to Netflix or to Slack or any other provider running in AWS is only valid in that environment? How do you detect when it's actually being used outside? And today we're going to focus on how do you detect when it's used from the attacker's AWS account and not just an attacker's laptop from their house. So who's doing this well? I, I still haven't seen anything public that I know about that where they're detecting this kind of type of compromise well. Amazon Guard Duty is doing some detections, but they're doing detections of outside of AWS. And so if you think of the scope of AWS, that's rather large. As I mentioned just now, there's multiple players in the game, Netflix, Slack, many, many other people are actually using AWS, including the attackers. And so we wanted to actually detect outside of our environment within AWS, knowing that AWS is very large. Most companies operate there, including the attackers. We wanted to really narrow down and know when our credentials are actually being used outside of our environment. And so that's where we're trying to solve this. Um, and why is it so hard? Well, at Netflix, it's very, very hard for us just due to our scale. We are very large. I don't know if we are the largest deployment still in AWS, but we have hundreds of thousands of instances at any given time in our environment. If you've ever operated in AWS, there's things called rate limits. And rate limits are essentially what AWS is using to protect their APIs so that they can service every customer. 
In order for us to describe our production environment in the three regions that we operate in, it can take us an hour to describe every server running. So if you think about trying to constantly describe those IP addresses in our environment to see are any calls being made outside of Netflix AWS, it can take very, very long to get that. And if you think of how dynamic our environment is, it's a constant change of IP address that we have to constantly be aware of to correlate back to the data that we're actually trying to figure, did a, did a credential get used outside of our environment? And so it's very hard for us to, at any given moment, any given second, know exactly what IPs we might have had in our environment. That we might have missed something. And so I needed to try to focus this solution outside of I will never know, or with the assumption that I will never know the IP space in my uh, cloud. So the tool that we're actually going to use today for this detection mechanism is uh, something that cloud, uh, AWS offers for free. It's called CloudTrail. Uh, it is now enabled by default in everyone's account in the console for 90 days, uh, or I guess previous 90-day access. You can see every call that's been made. Uh, it's the first thing you should turn on in your account if you're operating in AWS. It's 100% free, except for the storage of the logs that they deliver to you. But it's very minimal cost, and from a security perspective, especially around the, the focus of this talk, it's key for this to work. Uh, so CloudTrail, for those that aren't familiar, is the audit trail within AWS. Think of it as a recording of every single API call that you make. And uh, this is via the console, the SDKs, the command line, or any AWS service doing something on your behalf for you. As I mentioned, you can access, it, uh, access this in the console, 90-day history by default, or you can have it delivered through CloudWatch Logs, the simple server, uh, storage service, S3. If you choose to have it delivered to S3, which we'll cover in this talk, uh, the file name will be something of this format. Uh, and you can choose to centralize all of your CloudTrail to a single bucket and then kind of centralize your pipeline of data processing off that bucket. When you choose the S3 de uh, delivery option, the CloudTrail team will be buffering up API call audit uh, history and delivering those 15 to 20 minutes delayed from when those calls actually happened. So one thing to note with this at least avenue of detection today that we're going to talk about, uh, you will have a 15 to 20 minute delay but there are other avenues to get these calls faster. Uh, it's just when you think about the S3 delivery method, uh, which is the sample architecture today we'll cover, it's a 15 to 20 minute delayed window. So if we dig a little deeper in what CloudTrail actually has and why it's useful for us, we can look here and see that one of the most important features of CloudTrail is user identity. And within user identity, you can have the type of credential that's actually making that call. In this case, it's an IAM user, but in the case that we're actually going to focus on here briefly is IAM roles. But if we dig into user identity, we have what's called an Amazon resource number, and this is the unique ID of the thing making operations or API calls in your account. And this is what we're going to track. We're going to track temporary credentials issued to these ARNs, and we're going to focus on whether or not these credentials are being used in our environment or not. And once we go through this, we're going to see a live demo that was recorded because demo gods have not been good here at AppSec Cali from what I gather. Uh, but you're going to see this live and in action in real time. Uh, so the demo that I'm going to show you today is not based on the S3 files. It's based on real time logs via CloudWatch events. Um, but it should hopefully not disappoint. If we dig a little more into CloudTrail, we can see what event or API call was actually called. What region did it happen in? And most importantly for this, call, uh, this talk, the source IP of this call. And so we're going to build up this kind of history of source IP is being made and generalize whether or not a call is being made within our environment or not. So one of the common best practices for CloudTrail is that you deliver it via S3 to a bucket. Now you can still choose to operate on a faster log source via CloudWatch logs or CloudWatch events, but it's generally good to have a audit log that you store for a longer period of time, be it for compliance or other reasons. Uh, and one of the best practices is if you're operating in many accounts, that you centralize the CloudTrail records to a single bucket. This helps for a lot of different logistical reasons from an orchestration of infrastructure. But if you can have all logs go into a central bucket, you can control access to those logs well. You can then kick off your pipeline for data processing from a central point, and you no longer have to worry about orchestrating the different versions of lambdas or whatever you're trying to use 
to orchestrate that from outside. So at Netflix, we've chosen to centralize all of our, our CloudTrail via S3 to a CloudTrail bucket. And from there, we can then kick off many different pipelines to analyze those logs for anomaly detection, credential compromise detection, and so on and so forth, whatever we'd like to look at. So when I first started trying to do, solve this problem, I was attacking it from a very straightforward approach. And some of the, the problems that I talked about earlier of why it's so hard, I defined some requirements to say, I wanted to know all the IPs in my environment for all of our accounts for the last hour. So I needed to have this window of time that I was actually keeping the IP's history in our environment, mainly because I needed a history of it knowing that I was 15 to 20 minute delayed in log delivery, but I wanted to keep some extra data around. Once, if I, if I could have all the IPs in my environment to the resolution that I needed, well then as I'm analyzing these CloudTrail logs, I can just look at the IP source and say, did I have this IP at this time? If the answer is yes, all is well. If the answer is no, then potential compromise. So alert if you don't have the IP, continue moving if you do. The problem was, in our environment, we're rather large. There's things called pagination with APIs in AWS, which is essentially you have so much data that you have to make several calls to actually describe that data. And once you're making several calls in a row, at our scale, you get rate limited quite a bit. And that's where the previous mention of it could take an hour to describe our production environment in three regions comes about. We operate in a very large account structure. Lots of calls need to happen in order for us to describe our entire environment. And it became basically impossible for me to actually assert at a given second of time what IPs I actually had and do that actual comparison that I was looking for. So while our cloud networking team was re-architecting some event-driven uh, data uh, structures for uh, networking IP allocations, I went off to figure out how could I solve this? Is it possible to do it another way? And that's where I came up with this approach that we're here to discuss today. So this approach uses a leverage uh, or an understanding of how AWS works to our advantage, which we'll, we'll discuss how credentials are actually crafted and delivered to the servers and how they're actually used. So once you have an understanding of how AWS works, we can make a strong assumption that I feels reasonable and you can d decide whether you agree with me or not. And after we have that understanding and an assumption, we can then run this processing on it and then hopefully profit. And by profit, I mean we can detect potential misuse of our credentials in our environment via employees being curious, doing things that are an anti-pattern to our deployment methodologies, or perhaps even a malicious actor. And the method that I'm about to describe can be used historically as a uh, have we ever been potentially compromised in the past, or you can start that detection mechanism today, and within six hours coverage, you'll have full coverage within your environment if you are centralizing CloudTrail the way that I described earlier. Now, I say six hours, and that's because, as I mentioned earlier, when credentials are crafted by the EC2 and STS service, they're between one to six hours long from a valid period. And so those are being rotated at least once every six hours. So you could start this today and within six hours have full coverage in your environment. Uh, so let's take a look at how AWS actually works. Given these services, we have our Amazon EC2 instance uh, running on the left. We're going to interact with very different things. Uh, excuse me, we have our server in the middle. So when you first launch a service in AWS, you're launching an EC2 server. The Amazon EC2 uh, service is actually going to call out to the IAM service via the STS protocol and do an assume role. The IAM service is actually going to respond back to EC2 and give you the temporary credentials. Those credentials are available in three forms, an access key, a secret key, and a session token. These are then going to be passed to the metadata service. And the metadata service is an, an HTTP endpoint that is essentially virtually available to your server. These credentials are hosted on a certain path of that endpoint and provided to the SDKs and various different uh, pieces of software that you might be running on your server. Uh, when your SDK needs to make calls to AWS, it's going to reach out to the metadata service to look for the credentials. It'll then cache those credentials and then use the credentials to sign API calls that will be made to the API service. When an API call is made to the service, the service will then check the validation of the signature. Uh, IAM behind the scenes is checking the permission. 
and then the, a the AWS service is actually going to decide whether or not it's going to log that call in CloudTrail. And we'll discuss why that's important here in a little bit. But the most important piece is the EC2 <laughs> service is going to craft a temporary token for you and pass that to the service. One of the great benefits that we have and what we're going to use here is that when the EC2 service is crafting a session credential, a temporary token, it's passing the server instance ID in as the session name. And within Amazon, instance IDs are globally unique across all customers. And so we know that that temporary credential that's crafted is for my server and my server only. And from there, we can track that unique token and see how it's being used in our environment. So the strong assumption that we're going to use here is that first call wins. As we see these temporary credentials being crafted for the individual service, the first IP address that we see being used by this temporary credential is the one that we're going to assume is the source of truth. We're going to lock that uh, to that IP address, and then any deviation from that IP address will be a potential compromise or a misuse of this credential. So we were to diagram this out of a flow chart, the pink areas would actually be the path to compromise. And we'll zoom in on each one and discuss how we actually do that. So if you think we're uh, centralizing CloudTrail via a single S3 bucket and then doing some analysis as files are being delivered, we're going to actually go through and process the CloudTrail as we receive it. In a CloudTrail file, you'll have an array of records that you'll go through. So you're going to go through the records, and we're going to look for that initial EC2 assume role call that they're crafting those first set of temporary credentials for your instance. If we have it in a session table, or we're going to ask that question, is it in the session table? If not, we're going to add it to this temporary session table that we're building, and then we're going to continue go, we're going to just continue on and go through and process more CloudTrail. And we're going to just continue forward and forward until we actually have built up every single credential in our environment. If it's not the EC2 uh, service doing the assume role call, we're going to see if it's a call from an assumed role credential. If you remember back, the example CloudTrail record that I showed was an IAM user. In this case, we're looking for an IAM role of a type assumed role. If it's an assumed role call, that means that it's a temporary credential making an API call in our environment. And so then we're going to move on and ask, do we have record of the session credential being minted already? And this is where that zero to six hours comes in. If we don't know that the credential has been minted, we just throw that record away and continue processing. Now you can choose to just, as you see a unique record, even if you haven't seen that initial mint of, by the EC2 service, you can choose to lock on that IP at that point. But in this implementation, we've chosen to just continue moving forward knowing that eventually we'll see that actual EC2 instant uh, minting that credential, and then we can continue processing from there. If you have it in the session table, we're going to check a uh, edge case, which we'll cover in a bit. And these edge cases are whether or not it's AWS making a call on your behalf, or whether you've chosen to whitelist a specific set of IP addresses that you allow credentials to be issued for, or used from. Maybe you allow your developers to actually pull credentials down and use it from your VPN, but in this case, you're actually able to uh, move credentials a little bit in your environment. If it's not AWS or within the whitelist that you might have, we're going to check the source IP. If the source IP matches, or if it has the source IP in, the, uh, in our list, we're going to see if it matches. If it doesn't, then we're going to alert. If it does match, then we know that this credential is being issued in our environment from an area that we already know and we're going to just continue on as normal. And so you're going to continue processing these CloudTrail records on and on and on, and only alert from a deviation. When you're making calls in AWS, it's somewhat important to understand how traffic flows. <clears throat> this will give you an idea of how, what IP addresses you might expect, as well as if you're actually going to get a public or a private IP address. So in this network diagram, we have a simple VPC, virtual private cloud in AWS, with an external and an internal subnet. If you look at uh, the flow one, uh, we have an instance and an external subnet talking, making an API call to the internet. This call is going to go directly to the internet, directly to the API for Amazon, and you're going to see a public IP registered in the source IP. If, if we're deployed internally, and you see number two, the network flow, 
the internal network traffic is actually going to flow outbound via a NAT gateway. And so in this case, you're going to see the NAT gateway public IP as the source IP. And so what that means, internal, internally deployed instances are going to share that same public IP in the table that we're actually going to build. So don't be alarmed as you're building this table that you see multiple keys being valid from the same IP address across your infrastructure. Now one caveat to this entire thing is if you have VPN, uh, VPC endpoints or VPC gateways, like the S3 endpoint gateway, flow three and four here, no matter which subnet you're deployed in, external or internal, if you make a call that happens to go over a private endpoint, you're gonna see a private IP actually in your private or in your source IP address. So you're gonna need to account for potentially seeing a public IP and a private IP for the same key. But at that point, hopefully you know what your private IP, sub, uh, IP space is, and you'll be able to say, is this within my IP space or not? I debated for a long time whether to actually put what the sample architecture was for this, because it just seemed very, very simple. Has anyone in the crowd ever drew, drawn a straight line architecture? <laughs> it was kind of amazing after I drew it. I was like, wow, this is actually quite simple. And it kind of leads back to my, this is not this complex machine learning hard problem. Uh, you can deploy this rather quickly and uh, can be very, very effective. But here we, once again, we have CloudTrail being centralized to a bucket. In our case, we chose to have an SNS topic be invoked on file delivery to the bucket. This allows us to kick off multiple pipelines. You can have multiple things subscribed to that SNS topic and do multiple things on the files being delivered. In this case, in the demo that we're going to show today, we have a Lambda function going to be kicked off, and that Lambda function is going to be doing that processing and using a DynamoDB on the back end to create that session state as we see the credentials being minted and lock into the IP addresses. And we'll build one right here uh, in a second manually. Uh, we're using Dynamo to kind of leverage what they have called the TTL feature. So in Dynamo, you can set a column up and have it be the TTL value. And Dynamo will actually start deleting records automatically once that TTL value has expired. And so in this case, the software, all it's doing is adding rows and updating them at will. And as we see instances die off, those session state table or rows are just going to fall off automatically. So we're using Dynamo just as a leverage tool to be able to make fast queries as well as clean up the data by itself. So if we had a session table look like this, we have an identifier, which in, in our case is going to be the instance ID. It's that globally unique identifier for a server within Amazon. Uh, we're going to have the source IP for the call that we made. We're going to lock on the ARN, which is the key that was minted for that instance. And then the TTL value, which we're going to create with a six or eight hour window, however long you want to keep the data around. Uh, but ultimately, you just want this table to be as lean as possible. And the, the end result of this table will be every session token crafted in your environment that's valid. So if we were to build this manually, we'd go in here and we'd see that the user identity was an AWS service called the EC2 service. And as we, if you remember the flowchart, the first thing we want to look for is the assume role call by the EC2 service. So you're going to see that the service type in the user identity was EC2, but they're also going to fill out the source IP address as ec2.amazonaws.com. From here, if we look in the request parameters, this is the data that we're really interested in. The session name is going to be that instance ID, in this case ending in 2131, and we're going to see the actual role that they're issuing that credential off of. The role in this case is called my cool role. In the response elements, you're going to see the session token returned and a bunch of other information, but in this case, we have what we need to fill out that first row. So if we were to add this data into the session table, we have our instance ID, 2131 of my cool role, and we created a TTL value to start off with. So we're going to continue processing this as we go on. When that token actually becomes invalid and the EC2 service refreshes that for us, the identifier is going to be the exact same. You're going to have the same uh, 2131 instance ID, and in that case, all you're going to do is update the TTL value in your session table to say, hey, this instance is still alive and we want to keep this record available. So now we have a, the first instance of, the, uh, of a session token, but we haven't actually locked it to an IP address yet. So we'll go through here and we say the user identity is type assume role. So that's triggering us that it's a session token, a temporary credential actually making the call. 
the ARN in this case is the assumed role, my cool role. And as you see, at the end of this ARN is the actual session that the EC2 had put in on that assume role call. So we know this is being made from 2131 instance ID. In that case, we could go down and see what call did they actually make. We can see that it was an EC2 call with an event name of describe instances in region US West 2. But most importantly, we now have a source IP address of 52.95.255.121. And so this is the first time that we've seen a call from this temporary unique credential. And so we're going to go into this table and say, do we have something already? Uh, in, do we have a row for this instance? If we do, then we're just going to update this row. And this becomes our lock IP. So from now on, any time that we see this session credential being used, we can compare it to that source IP and determine whether it's being used in our environment or not. And most importantly, is it being used on the server that it was minted on, or in the worst case scenario, within the same internal subnet that it was minted from, knowing that all internal subnet uh, source IPs will be the NAT gateway that we have in our environment. So let's continue to process a little more. We see here again, we have a user identity type of assumed role. The ARN is my cool role once again with the instance ID of 2131. We go down here and see it's a described volumes call this time, and the source IP is 52.95.255.121. If you're really good with numbers, you might already know that we just saw this IP. So when you make the comparison, we know we already have this IP, and so we know this is a good call. We can continue moving forward. So we continue on, and in this case, we have assumed role once again. And as you can guess, it's my cool role for the same instance. We'll move down here and see in the event name, it's actually a call called get caller identity. Now, get caller identity is similar in Linux to who am I. It's going to tell you this, who the keys are or what key you're actually running with. This might be in a, a malicious actor's first step in the cloud when they find credentials. It, it's a good way to determine is the credential that I've found actually valid and what, is it, what potentially could the permissions mean. Uh, other people are actually using Git caller identity to do a source of identity trust for initial bootstrapping of other credentials like HashiCorp Vault. But it could be something that never, you don't see in your environment and you could trigger off of by itself. But in our case, we don't really care what the event is. What we care about is the source IP. And, in, and here you can see it's a 67.178.52.232. If you're familiar with AWS, you know this is an Amazon IP space. But if we just follow the process that we've, we've talked about, we compare this to the IP that we know about from my cool role of the instance ID 2131, and we know that these aren't the same, so this is where we alert. So this is where I mentioned it might be just a, a developer that might have pulled credentials down, uh, but potentially it's that malicious actor. But it's, an, it's enough data that we've gathered that we know it's not operating in our environment, and we should probably go look at it. So we're going to walk through a quick video demo. But essentially, I've launched a sample service, and I'm going to be pulling down the credentials, using them from uh, the, the instance, my laptop, and then a, another AWS account of mine. And we'll see how this method actually detects. So here I have a sample service launched in uh, my reInvent uh, account. I've launched it with my role. It has an IP address of 54.209.183.1. Uh, I already have an initial table row filled out for this. Uh, I have the instance ID that was shown previously. We see that it's my role running, and I have the source IP locked. And so this is a, just a <coughs> simple view of the Dynamo table that we have. So short, now I'll SSH into that instance, and I'm going to create an S3 bucket. The S3 create is actually a, a call that you will get within S3. Um, so first, I'm going to show you that I actually have uh, credentials for this instance. I'm going to run the S3 API create bucket call. I'm going to call it something like good from instance. In this case, I did this for reInvent. So I created a bucket. And we're going to go back to Slack, where we're going to actually have some semi-real-time detection. So here we see that. Uh, we know that this IP, I'm on the instance where the credential was minted. In this case, 
I'm actually having my uh, methodology print out whether the call was good or not. So we actually have a view from Otterbot saying this call was great. Uh, so now I have a script that I've written that essentially SSS H into our instance, curls the metadata service for the credentials that I'm running with, and then exports them into my local environment so that I can use them. So we're going to go ahead and steal the credentials and bring them down to my laptop and try creating a bucket again. So here I've just echoed out the credentials. I'm going to export them uh, later. Uh, but here, let's create a bucket and see whether or not this can actually be detected. So I'm going to create a bucket called good from lap or bad from laptop, and hopefully this methodology will detect it. If we go back to Otterbot, within seconds we have Otterbot actually showing me that the source IP 69.23.134.92 does not equal the expected IP that we would have seen. And so this is something that AWS Guard Duty can do as well. It won't be necessarily in, uh, delivered as fast as this, as we're actually using the CloudWatch event CloudTrail stream uh, in this demo. But Guard Duty does a good job of actually telling you that credentials are being used outside of AWS. But if you remember, I copied the credentials earlier. I'm going to show you that on this rogue AWS account of mine, I actually don't have a role on this instance. So the STS get caller identity fails. I don't have actual credentials, so I can't do anything. I'm going to paste in the credentials that I pulled from the instance, run get caller identity again, show that I'm running as the credentials of the first instance that I was on, and then I'm going to try to create an S3 bucket. So this bucket is being created from the rogue instance uh, in a different AWS account. In, this methodology will detect that was actually being run as well. And so here you can see two Amazon IPs. One is the expected, the 54.209.183.1, and the call from the rogue instance was from 54.89.102.8. So we've successfully detected credential compromise and a pivot to a different AWS account. And so that's a key differentiator that I was trying to solve when implementing this, is I wanted to actually be able to tell when credentials were being used outside of Netflix's AWS environment and not just AWS in general. So let's switch back and talk about those edge cases. So I mentioned that uh, there are a few edge cases. We talked about the VPC endpoint. So every so often, you're making a call that actually goes through an endpoint, and the IP that you're going to see in your CloudTrail is actually a private IP. When Amazon makes calls on your behalf, the IP address you see in source IP address is actually going to be that of an Amazon domain. So if EC2 is doing things on your behalf, you're going to see the, or, the source IP of ec2.amazonaws.com. Uh, if, if they're auto-scaling your server group for you, you're going to see autoscaling.amazonaws.com. So you need to keep in mind that your credential is going to be used from outside of your environment by a trusted AWS. So as long as you trust AWS to use your credential uh, why, uh, within reason, uh, you can whitelist the Amazon domain and then just continue on if you see that. If you're deploying an instance into an external subnet, the first thing it does is it's going to get a public IP. If it's going to attach a elastic IP, an elastic IP is a static IP assigned to your AWS account that you can attach to one server in the public uh, address space. If, if you've launched and then attached an Elastic IP, chances are you might see two different public IPs for that minted credential. So in this case, you want to keep track of any associate address calls that target your, your instances and allow one deviation or in deviations from that potential pub, first public IP. So if I've launched with a, an external subnet, I've assigned myself a public IP, I've made a call to attach a new IP, I'm now going to, every subsequent call from there, actually be logged with that new IP. So you're going to be, you're going to want to be able to determine whether or not you can deviate one or n number of times, depending on how many times your IP changes for that external subnet. So keep those kind of edge cases in mind. So now that we've talked about detecting compromise, let's pivot briefly to how can we prevent it altogether. Ultimately, that's the solution as us security people want to to do is let's prevent it from the get-go. 
Uh, and so 169.254.169.254, .169 for those familiar with AWS, is the IP to the dreaded metadata service. It's an attacker's f first point of entry if they find a vulnerability such as server-side request forgery or XML external entity ejection. It's where credentials are being stored, and most importantly for an attacker, it's unauthenticated. Any, any plain text curl request to the endpoint will get you lots and lots of data. And so an example of server-side request forgery is you're an attacker, you found a web application, when you make a GET request to that application, it's actually making a fetch to a remote application as well. It's taking the response from that application, combining it, and then providing you a combined response back. That's a normal flow for the application, but if an attacker or malicious actor is actually able to abuse the application and get, trick it to request metadata credentials, what's going to happen is they're going to, the common request in AWS is to go for the credential path in the metadata service. So the malicious actor is going to trick this application to make a request on, your, on its behalf to the metadata service. In this case, the metadata service is going to return those credentials and then pass those back to the malicious actor. <clears throat> and that's, in my opinion, or what I've heard is the number one attack vector for applications in the cloud that have server-side request forgery. Uh, typically, a compromised AWS credential is a critical finding in a bug bounty program and max payout. In many cases, a exposed credential, depending on the privilege that it has, can lead to account compromise as well, or further pivoting within that environment, potential leakage of sensitive data. If you've ever tried to block this in a WAF, it's very, very hard. There's many, many IPs that you're trying to block, and you can enumerate all those IP addresses and all the different re representations from decimal to octal to IPv6, and then you can create that blacklist for your WAF address, and if you ever see these in the, the full path of the domain, then you can block that. But then you take, as an attacker, say, okay, they're blocking this, let me just go create a short URL, and then all of a sudden you bypass that WAF protection, and you're right where you were from the beginning. So we wanted to, try to first tackle it like this, and we figured that, okay, this might not be the best way to do it. Let's figure out how we can just protect the credentials or prevent them from ever being compromised through this type of scenario. The first approach that we did was what we call API enforcement or API protect at Netflix, and it's essentially a managed policy. A managed policy at, uh, in AWS is a, a man, uh, an IAM policy that you can apply to one or many different roles. So in this case, the managed policy for API Protect internally is an enumeration of, the, of each account. The enumeration contains every NAT gateway IP. If you remember back to the network diagram that we showed earlier, internal, internally deployed applications, the public IP that you see is the NAT gateway. So we're going to enumerate all the NAT gateway IPs in our account, all of the VPCs and all the VPC endpoints in our account, and we're going to attach this managed policy to all internally deployed roles with the idea that these roles will only work from the conditions that we've supplied. And so the manage, this managed policy here is doing a deny on any action against any resource in our account if these conditions aren't met, if one of these conditions aren't met. And what that's allowed us to do is actually in cases where a credential might have been leaked via uh, an SSRF or XXE, when the attacker or malicious actor gets that credential themselves, their IP address is not the same, their VPC ID is not the same. There's no way that they can take that, that uh, set of credentials that they've been able to pull maliciously from the app and use it in their environment effectively. Uh, we had one case in a bug bounty where a, a researcher was able to get a set of credentials. They were invalid because of this protection, and we actually asked the researcher to try to bypass, see if they could find a way or a single API call that would work, and luckily the results were very much in favor of us and this protection actually worked. The one gap here is, as, as we know with the, the network flow, this can only be assigned to things deployed internally. So if, if you have something that you have a role in the external subnet, the IP that you're going to see is the public IP of that instance. In our world at Netflix, we have so many public IPs that, and our environment is so, dynamically changing so much that we can't continuously update this managed policy to reflect every public IP in our environment. So all we can protect is actually the internal resources that we've deployed. So we know this is at least effective to a certain extent, uh, 
but can we take it one step farther? And that's where we get into metadata protection. And so instead of uh, focusing on protecting the credential in the case that it is ex uh, exfilled by a malicious actor, can we actually protect against the credential from ever being compromised? Can we actually prevent the credential from being exfilled by a given vulnerability, such as server-side request forgery? Uh, when we first started looking at this, we started analyzing how do other cloud providers do it? GCP has a header on their metadata service. It turns out that's very effective towards this type of attack. Typically in a server-side request forgery attack, as an attacker or malicious actor, you do not have control of the actual HTTP headers that are being with, sent with the request that you've tricked the app to make. And so if you can require a header that's needed to make a request to the metadata service, then you could potentially mitigate this class of attack altogether against the credentials. GCP has it. A lot of people uh, talk about how nice that is. It turns out GCP also has a beta endpoint that's still enabled that doesn't have this protection as well. So kind of a pivot across. But when we tried to work with Amazon on this, it became clear that it's very difficult to, after the fact, add a header without potentially breaking customers. And how do you actually deploy that? And so it seemed like we weren't going to get much traction in this movement anytime soon. So we, we tried thinking, what else could we do? Uh, we had already done some experimentation with how do you actually rotate credentials in the cloud. Uh, when we did that, we found some uh, gaps in the SDKs within Amazon. And so we already had a relationship with the SDK team. And so I reached out to them to see, hey, could we just add a header that's being sent to every metadata request? And then that will enable us to build a proxy. They went back and thought about it and said, you know, we really don't feel comfortable adding a header that our partner service, the metadata, isn't expecting. So we can't do this for you right now. Uh, so I went ahead and built a POC just to see what this traffic looked like. Could we potentially do some anomaly detection by looking at paths and how often things are being hit? And the, the one thing I forgot and noticed right away was every request being sent by the SDK to the metadata service, there was a user agent being sent. And lucky for me, the user agent was not being set to anything, or I, you could say unlucky. Uh, and so what I did as an experiment was I made a PR request to the AWS Ruby SDK. All the AWS SDKs are open source. Uh, feel free to contribute to all of them. Uh, so what I did was I made a PR request to the Ruby SDK, wrote up an, a nice blurb about how this would enable us to protect ourselves against server-side request forgery, and therefore protecting our credentials. The Ruby library actually said, hey, this is cool. Yeah, we'll accept this. They merged it. I took this PR. I went to the Java SDK, did the same thing. Went to the Bodo SDK, Python, so on and so forth. And so I'm happy today to say that the latest SDKs as of, I think it was like August last year, have this, new, this user agent being set. As I got the SDKs uh, to merge these, I then took that back to the global SDK team at AWS, and they were able to get them to agree that they will make sure these user agents never change so that you can actually deploy something like this and protect uh, your metadata service. So while it wasn't the initial result that we were hoping for where the metadata would just have this header that was required from now on, we actually have a path forward for protecting credentials and preventing this class of attack and hopefully mitigating it in the entire environment. So if we were to look at what this would actually look like now, in this case, I'm running a Python project. The Python SDK in AWS is called Boto3. And so the user agent is Boto3 slash version slash a bunch of other things. And so a request to get credentials from the Boto library would now look like this. The user agent would say Boto3. The metadata proxy could have a whitelist that looks for user agents that start with something. The proxy sees that the user agent's what it expects, actually allows that request to go through, and then the application actually gets its credentials. And if we look back at what that server-side request forgery uh, of an attacker would look like, in this case, it's a Python Flask app. Uh, the nor or one of the most popular uh, HTTP request library in Python is called Requests. And so in this case, I've tricked the application into making a request to the metadata service for credentials. The metadata proxy would see the user agent of Python-requests, which is the default user agent. 
And in this case, it would block it and send back a 401 unauthorized or 403 or 915, get the hell out of here. Whatever code you want to send back to that attacker to kind of troll them, feel free. But in this case, the most important piece is we're now able to actually mitigate an entire class of vulnerability in our environment against AWS credentials. And from a team standpoint, that sole responsibility is protection of IAM and the credentials, that was pretty powerful. So it was really cool to work with our AppSec team on coming up with how we could actually do this and get it rolled out and prove it to be very effective. And so the SDKs that I know are supported today, because I've verified and at least have touched or PR'd most of these, are all the Python SDKs, the Golang, both Java SDKs, Node.js, and Ruby. Uh, if you do PHP or C Sharp, my apologies, I didn't want to relearn all languages, only a few. And most importantly, it was probably, I didn't want to set up a dev environment to try to figure those out. Uh, but the SDK team has agreed to support these types of changes. Uh, and I just have not gone to verify to see have the changes propagated to those libraries. But today, you can actually go out and protect your metadata service yourself. Um, we've actually released uh, an open source version of a proxy to give you a, a sample of what you could actually go deploy. It's written in Golang. It's about 80 or 100 lines ago. You can literally clone the repo, go build, and start protecting your metadata service today. Uh, the user agents that I know about that are in the existing SDKs, they start with AWS-SDK- it's usually SDK dash uh, language. Uh, Boto, Boto Core, and the CLI and Chalice are all Python based libraries. Uh, the Python team chose to go away from the other libraries and use their own user agents. That's why there's five. Uh, but these are the user agents that if you wanted to build a proxy uh, that's not off of our example proxy, that these are the user agents you'd want to uh, look for patterns that were like this. Uh, so to wrap things up, we've now detected compromise. And we've figured out some ways to prevent compromise. And most importantly, through this whole uh, experience, the more you understand CloudTrail and how AWS works, the easier it is in your environment to detect and work off anomalous behavior. Uh, I mentioned that it's, or if you remember that when we were looking through how AWS actually works, it's up to the API and the service that you're calling the API against to actually log it to CloudTrail. And so what that really means is not everything's logged in CloudTrail, and it's important to understand what's actually logged. And so I have an open source project where I'm attempting to actually do that and enumerate every API call in AWS and then cross-reference that to what's logged in CloudTrail. Uh, feel free to take a look at it. It's called Trailblazer, because uh, we're blazing CloudTrail since 2018. Um, there's an example implementation of the credential compromise detection in our Skunkworks repo, as well as the metadata proxy example. Uh, so I urge you all, if you have any uh, sort of itching to take a look and try to fix these kind of things in your environment, please take a look. If you have any questions or feedback, I'm happy to answer those as well. Um, but thank you all for coming out today. Um, once again, I'm Will from Netflix, and thank you, AppSec, for having me.